at least the first one, to enter it. Um, and in the process, in the process of this happening, uh, the man initially didn't know who Jesus was. Initially, he, he said, I don't, I don't know, but obviously he had some authority. He told me to get up and walk, and I did after 38 years. Uh, and later on, Jesus reintroduces himself, and he's able to tell the Jews who asked him. Remember, the Jews is a code word in John. That means the unbelieving Jews. Uh, was able to tell them it was Jesus. And so that started a whole nother conflict, didn't it? Not only did he tell this man to get up and take up his pallet and walk down the street, probably an inch too far for the Sabbath, doing an inch, uh, an inch too much work on the Sabbath, in their opinion, Jesus himself was working on the Sabbath, as if he was a doctor writing a prescription, as if he was a physical therapist encouraging somebody at the gym, you know, to work their muscles to, to get better, as if it was something like that, that he was engaging in a business. So they were mad. When Jesus ended in verse 17, he said, listen, my father is working until now. My father is working until now, and I myself am also working. How many of y'all ever really worked with your dad? You did, Bill. Did, I mean, it's very uncommon. We have take your kid to work day because normally hey, kids don't come to work with us. Um, occasionally, Jacob and I have one of our sons here, but that's not usually a positive experience for them because <laughs> we're homeschooling. We are the principal. They come to the principal's office, right? Gabriel's staring at me. He's staring down. Look at that now. It's never Gabriel, I'm sure. I, I, I had the privilege, the, the honor, to work with my dad a lot. My, my dad, for many of, most of my formative years, let's say, he was always a woodworker, but he was a full-time woodworker from the time I was 12 until I was, long after I was out of the house. And we worked some long days because my dad could work and work and work because every dollar that came in, every bill that got paid, everything that got done, everything he achieved was done with his own two hands. And as long as dad worked, we worked. I thank the Lord for that gift. And Jesus is saying the same thing. My father is doing this work. Now remember the Sabbath was based on God's behavior, wasn't it? Sabbath was based on the pattern that God set that he created on the first six days and he rested on the seventh, which is, by the way, our, our Saturday, <laughs> not Sunday. We can talk about why that changed. A day of rest. Well, that's important, the order. He created life and then he rested. It becomes, it becomes important here. He created life and then he rested. But we'll get to that. What made the people upset was two things. It, that Jesus appeared to be breaking the Sabbath. He appeared to be working on the seventh day to them, in their opinion. Remember, a lot of this was opinion. Sometimes it's very hard to separate what is an opinion about the Sabbath, what is an opinion about the application of the law, and what the law actually said. Uh, it is widely presumed, right, that, you can, that Jewish people observing the law cannot eat a cheeseburger based on what principle? The principle that you're not supposed to boil a kid in its mother's milk which I've never been tempted to do, uh, actually. It doesn't sound that appetizing, right? But you're not supposed to have, then they extrapolate, you're not supposed to have dairy and meat together. You're not supposed to have a cheeseburger. Well, the law doesn't say that. That's an interpretation of the law. And it was bound up, just sedimentary layer after layer after layer, built up onto what was actually a very simple code of law, 613 laws. We, we count. I have not counted them, and I won't. Don't ask me to. I'm just going by other people's numbers. 613 laws to run a whole nation. It, there are at least that many in one chapter of your tax code in this country. See, when God makes something, it's simple, it's efficient, and it's effective. He had 613 laws with which to govern an entire nation. Uh, people had begun to ignore God's intent with that. So he was working on the Sabbath, they thought. But man, that was nothing compared to the other thing he just said. My father is working until now. 
Wait a second, Jesus. Don't you mean our Father? Like the Father of the nation, the Father of this whole people. We're the people upon whom God has set his very name, the people of Yahweh. The people who received his special grace and mercy, which they, they had. They had treated it poorly for many, many years, but they had. Y'all know that Israel means one who strives with God, right? Literally, when Jacob, who became Israel, was striving with the angel of the Lord, that's when they received that name. If that were to happen with me, my name would be he who goes to the ER a lot. <laughs> if the defining conflict of my life was to result in my name, I would be the ER patient. Uh, but for Jacob, it was he who strives with God. Now, it's not important that we understand. They understood this to be Jesus claiming deity. They said he's making himself out to be the same as, to be equal with God, our Father. That was the difference in the pronouns there. Now, it doesn't matter to me one little bit what you think the relationship between Father and Son is. Y'all are getting used to that, right? I say I don't care a little too much for some people. I don't, I don't care if you think that my sons are equal to me or not. I do. They did. They, they understood that to claim to be the son of someone was to claim to be their essential, their intrinsic equal. And that's what this is based on. So, let's read this passage here this morning. I'll start back here. My father is working until now, and I myself is working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. They took this seriously. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You guys misunderstood me. No? Your Bible doesn't say that right? Good. That's accurate. <laughs> truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like or same, the word is really same, manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises up the dead or those devoid of life, and gives them life. Even so, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. I think it's real important that we understand that Jesus didn't apologize for what they thought. He did not defend himself. He did not apologize. He didn't backpedal. You find yourself backpedaling a lot with people? Just try walking into a crowd downtown El Paso on Tuesday. There'll be a big crowd of people there on Tuesday protesting your Second Amendment rights on the basis of preserving the children. Just try standing in the middle of that crowd and saying, folks, there are two genders. Better have your flag jacket on. Right? You'll feel like you got to backpedal. You don't have to backpedal. What you've said is true. God created the male and female. Male and female, he created them. That's it. So they have their, their theology correct. Jesus is saying, yes, I am equal with the Father. He doesn't apologize. He explains. He says, yes, you're right. I am working till now because my Father is working until now. Because Jesus' ministry was based on the principle of this, like son, like father. No, I didn't get it backwards. We say that 
See, sometimes people will say that about my boys, particularly these two here, these older ones. Well, well, like father, like son, it's about their sense of humor. Sorry, boys. Like father, like son, why is that? Because they know me. They know the way that I talk. They know what I find funny, that I'm a little bit satirical. Doesn't that sound educated? I'm not sarcastic. I'm satirical. That's better. That's right. There's a whole chunk of literature throughout history that prides itself on being satirical. So I'll, I'll claim that. But in this case, have they seen the Father? The scripture says no one has seen the Father at any time. So they have to flip it around. They have to say, like son, like father. This is the one we can see. And Jesus says, this is what it means that you can see me, like son, like father. Of course, that also means like father, like son. That's an equative relationship. That's like putting an equal sign in there. Father equals son, son equals father. So we could say that if we wanted. His enemies are great theologians. Isn't that wonderful? You have any enemies that know the Bible pretty well? You don't have enemies. You're too nice. You have some mild critics that are excellent theologians. I do. They have a system. It may not be adequately biblical, but they have something to say every time you object. Jesus doesn't object with what they say. They're good theologians. Like son, like father means... That Jesus does only what he sees the Father doing. Did you get that? That's what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. This plan isn't mine. Unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also in like manner. I got to thinking about that in my office this week. I said, man, that is scary business, isn't it? There's a little bit of a sting. Oh, what? what if my sons could only do what they saw me do? All the kids are smiling. Children, let me tell you something. In this world, it is a privilege for you to be able to see anything that your father does. I think it's like 25% of children in this culture at this time do not live with their father. So praise God for that, if you have that opportunity. But fathers, holy smokes, <laughs> we know that our children aren't limited to only doing the things that they see us do, thank Jesus. But it is significant in their lives, isn't it? We say that a lot. People, that Your children will not imitate what you say, they will imitate what you do. And that is very true. Whether you sit down and rest a little too much, Your children are prone to sit down and rest a little too much. If you work a little too much and are never home, they are prone to work too much and never be home and neglect the priorities that God has set in the home for you as a father. I won't go down the list, but you can extrapolate your own. I'm not a glutton for punishment either, guys. This isn't even Father's Day. Mothers get built up. Fathers kind of get kicked on Father's Day a lot of times. We, we try not to do it here. I wasn't even here on Father's Day. I, I punted. Not on purpose. The, father do, the son does only what he sees the father doing. That addresses problem number one. Problem number one was that they thought that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. They thought Jesus was just ignoring this principle that was actually pre-law. The, the, the principle of the Sabbath had existed before Moses. It was a standard. You work for six days, you rest on the seventh. Well, that's where that principle comes in. Remember, God rested after what? The six days of what was he doing? Making life, wasn't he? He was making every single living thing, and then he rested. He was granting life into a void. That was the pattern that God set. Remember, the son does only what the father does. He does only what he sees the father doing. And he was the only one that was there that saw that. That's in this environment here. 
There's no mystery between the Father and the Son. Like Son, like Father, He sees everything that He does, and He does it. Father loves the Son. So if they see Jesus doing something on the Sabbath, it's what He sees the Father doing. Giving life, and then rest. Like son, like father. Like son, like father means that he brings life into a place that is devoid of life. Son gives life to whom he wishes. We we touched on that a little bit earlier. The son gives life to whom he wishes. That was his prerogative. You know what that means? That means that the son, that, excuse me, that the father trusts the son's judgment. He has given that all into his hands. The healing, the resurrection, everything that he does, feeding people on the Sabbath, those things, those things were all exceptions to the rule. Those are dealing with people's very lives. One of the very simple, basic ways uh, that Jesus talked about this with people. He said, what man among you, if he has an animal that falls into a pit on the Sabbath wouldn't snatch him up out of there. What wouldn't preserve even that life? Life first, then rest. Life is the priority, right? Maybe we don't understand this in America very well, but rest is a priority of our lives. A priority, not the priority. See, if you're dead in your trespasses and sins, the Sabbath is irrelevant to you. Rest is irrelevant if you're dead. Yes? We put rest in peace on the gravestone. That's a massive euphemism. (laughs) Uh, If you're dead, rest is irrelevant. And Jesus is here to give life so that rest is then again relevant. Father has given all judgment to the Son. All judgment. The Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he himself is doing. The Father will show him greater works than these, greater things than restoring the life of a man who for 38 years could not even get himself into this pool of water. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. You know, that's what all of that creation account is about. Genesis 1 is is very short on information about what happens in eternity past. It's all about what happens in this world and this time. It's short on information what happens before that. But it tells us all about God preparing a place for our lives to be lived. And he spoke most things into existence, didn't he? That would be cool to watch. A creative reverberation going out through an earth that is formless and void. But with man, he took soil and he formed it into a shape. And he breathed life into it. There was no life there. It was devoid. I would dare say there was not even any bacteria in it yet. Devoid of life. Nothing to evolve. And he breathed life into the nostrils of that dirt thing. That's what Adam means, by the way. Kind of like dirt clawed. (laughs) Adama is the Hebrew word for dirt, (laughs) for soil. Into a place that was devoid of life. That was raising up the dead. That's what the dead means. Spoke it into life. He says, so the son, in the same way, he sees the father doing that. I think it's interesting it's in the present tense. It's constantly before him. He sees it happening all the time. He constantly has this in mind. So he gives life to whom he wishes. That's his prerogative given to him by his father because like son, like father, the father loves the son, and he gives life to whom he wishes. He emulates the father. Now some people... Say, well, that's, that's nice, Pastor Josh. All he wishes sure sounds like he doesn't give it to everybody. Really? Where's that? It doesn't say how many he wishes here, does it? 
everybody to whom every everybody to whom he wishes. Everybody received life, didn't they? How much life did God create in his creation account in, in Genesis 1? All of it. Jesus emulates the Father. What is he who, to whom does he provide life? Everyone who needs it. That's not the whole story, but that to whom he wishes. He offers life to everybody. Like son, like father. The father loves the son. The son does everything that he sees the father doing in like manner. See, a lot of people base a lot of their theology I've found here recently on a distinction between, uh, too sharp of a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They think, they, they read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is interesting, isn't it? Is that putting it mildly? The Old Testament is kind of difficult sometimes to read. We, I, I kind of joked about it last week. Are you commanded to exterminate the Canaanites? No, no, because you're not, you're not Israel. You're part of the church. That command was given to Israel as a nation in the Old Testament. But a lot of people hinge a lot of their doctrine, a lot of their theology on God being absolutely merciless and wrathful from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of Malachi. Did you, they may not realize that. And then they say, all of a sudden, when Jesus came, God is now full of grace and mercy and love and peace. Well, that doesn't fly. God's gracious all the way through Scripture. Yes, things changed. Yes, the time was full when Jesus came to the earth. But everything that you see the Son doing, the Father has done and is doing. If you see grace, everybody see grace in Jesus Christ? Who? Okay, you guys, listen. I had too many donuts this morning. I'm more awake than y'all. Come on now. Too many donuts. That's, at my age, that's any donuts. That's just any donuts. It's just too many. I ate them anyway. If you see grace in Jesus, where does that grace come from? The Father. If you see him restoring life, where does that come from? The Father, because life comes from the Father. If you see mercy in Jesus Christ, where does it come from? Father. Does God live in time? Does he care that we have an Old and a New Testament? No. He's God. He's other. He, he doesn't care about old and new. He just is. He just is. So please don't let me hear you talking about how grace was a new invention for the New Testament. Because that's not true. If you look back in the Old Testament and you don't see grace, it's, that's not a problem with God's character. That's a problem with how we're reading the Old Testament. Truthfully. Because Jesus is like his Father. The Son is like the Father. And that matters. Because for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son, i.e. he who dishonors the Son, dishonors the Father who sent him. That's another equative relationship. The, the honor that you accord to Father is the honor you accord to the Son. The dishonor you accord to the Son is the dishonor you accord to the Father. In this situation, they were dishonoring the Son, weren't they? They said the Son is breaking the Sabbath. The Son is calling His Father His Father. Duh. The Son is calling His Father the Father. And they were disrespecting the Father, dishonoring Him at the very point at which they were trying to honor him. We see it just as commonly. People dishonoring Jesus because of the way they perceive God himself, God the Father, by saying that he is not grace, 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 all the way through his character. And John tells us that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, 
Some of y'all have taught your children to drive. Yes? Personally? No, Tara has not, and Tara will not, apparently. Uh, my wife has done the heavy lifting on teaching my sons to drive, and I have not. <coughs> Remember that? Like son, like father, like father, like son. I know what they're capable of behind the wheel, right? Um, it's not necessarily a trust issue. It's more of a time issue, but we can joke about that, right? It's, it's not common we hear far more times where the father doesn't trust the son's judgment. He's not willing to give all judgment to his son. But remember, this son has done everything that the father has shown him, has done everything in the same way the father has given him to do. He is worthy of that trust. And he has given him all judgment in regards to life and death. This isn't talking about what we were talking about in Sunday school. By the way, y'all ought to come to Sunday school. It's not too late. We just finished our review in 1 Corinthians, first couple chapters. And uh, we'll continue on with chapter 3 and talking about the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. That is not a judgment of life and death. That is the judgment of someone's life, what they have done with it. The judgment over life and death is what we call the great white throne judgment. John's very clear. He gives life to whom he will. He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And this judgment is about life and death. Who gets life and who stays in death? He's given all of that judgment to the Son. Like Son, like Father. He gives life to all whom he wishes. And he says here, truly, truly, I say to you, is it true? I think I've told you this. I got in trouble one time. I think I actually may have received corporal discipline for sitting in my choir class with a very good man. I won't say anything. Bill Rare, no longer with us on this earth, been promoted. And I started off a statement, well, to tell you the truth, Principal Rare, lit me up. Well, you better be telling me the truth, son. It wasn't until 25 years later I realized that Jesus does the very same thing. He confirms that he's speaking the truth. He says, absolutely true, right here, truly, truly. Verily, verily, I'm speaking the truth. Don't miss it. This is not an illustration. This is not a story. This is not a demonstration. This is the truth. We all on the same page now? This is truth. I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has Today, now, eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Like son, like father. See, when you share the gospel, what do you tell people? Do you tell them to believe in God? Lots of people believe in God. A whole lot of people believe in God sitting in a meeting here recently where they had a benediction and I was told that I ought to appreciate, appreciate a, a, a Buddhist priest's view on something because he believed in God. That's not the way you ought to present the gospel. You have to take this in entire context here. Like son, like father, like father, like son. Believing in him who sent me is to understand that Jesus is acting and speaking with his divine prerogative as the son of God who is divine and perfect, who does everything that the Father has shown him to do, and he does it perfectly like the Father does. One who believes in him who sent me has eternal life, and this is the benefit. He does not come into judgment over life and death, the great white throne judgment. 
but is passed out of death into life. It's a perfect voice. Perfect verb there. It means it's already been done in the past. It has present ramifications. Specific judgment he's talking about that you avoid simply by believing in Jesus. To anyone who believes. Everyone who believes. A lot of people hinge a lot of their doctrine on whether or not you have an adequate amount or an adequate quality of some mysterious ingredient they call faith. Now, you know some of these people. You, you might even chuckle at some of these people, some of them straight up hillbillies. You, you ever seen these on the news? They swing around snakes like they're jump ropes and play around with them. Usually they've milked them before they do that, by the way in the back room somewhere, because they're not stupid. <laughs> they say, if you don't have faith enough to do that, you don't have good enough faith to receive eternal life. Other people will say that if you don't stop what you're doing in the middle of a worship service and start speaking in an unintelligible tongue, you do not have a high enough quality of faith to go to heaven when you die. I'm here to tell you that Jesus does not put that standard on your faith. He does not put that standard on your justification. He does not ask you to validate the faith that you have by going forth and doing nothing but righteousness. Thank Jesus. If that is not a, a praise item for your life, it should be. And you need to open your eyes a little more. And I've actually had people tell me they just flat don't sin anymore. With a straight face. Liar. I don't care what you, there it goes again. Man, I am being mean today. I don't care what you say about it. I, I, I have eyes too. In fact, Scripture says the very act of saying I don't sin anymore is a sin. <laughs> Go read 1 John. It doesn't require any special faith. Just faith. There are pews in this room. You believe that? This, by the way, is a pew in case that's too Christianese for you. These long benches. You believe that? Good. You believe in Jesus for eternal life? Yeah. You have passed out of death into life. Praise Jesus. And you can absolutely rely on the Son because the Son is just like the Father. Perfectly. Absolutely. We're going to appreciate that. Paul says we proclaim it until he comes. How he is the absolute perfect expression of God's grace throughout the ages. From the very beginning, he is a God of grace. And in his plan, he sent this very son who does nothing except what he sees the Father do, who gives life to whom he pleases, simply by grace, through simple, unadulterated faith. We're going to remember that that Son of God was the one who willingly came to give his life for us and was raised from the dead and is coming again. So I'm going to give you a few minutes maybe to express your appreciation in prayer to him, and then I'll ask the men to come forward.